And so I was like, how can I teach something to people about money and investment that hasn't been written before? Oh, yeah? Right. I mean, that, that sounds like a pretty small sliver of things we could talk about there that hasn't been written before. Right. And the truth of the matter is what I decided to write on is not something that was out of our invention. The idea of phases actually started with Charles Dow when he talked mm. about the bullish phase, the accumulation phase, etc. So I knew phases, though, was a good place to start. And then I took my special education background and how do I modify the curriculum of Wall Street investing money in such a way that it would be accessible to a much broader audience. This is the How to Trade Stocks Options podcast brought to you by 10MinuteStockTrader.com, where we cover finance, stocks, options, entrepreneurship, education, and money. And here's your host, voted one of the top 100 people in finance, Christopher Ewell. Today's episode is produced in partnership with FinClub.ai. Trade with confidence and take the guesswork out of trading with FinClub's artificial intelligence platform. Now you can get access to the best AI trading platform on the market for as little as $19 per month. That's almost the price of Netflix. So head on over to FinClub.ai to start your two week free trial right now. Remember, that's at FinClub.ai. Hey, make sure you subscribe and hit the bell so you'll be notified every time we give you more tools, tips, and tricks to help you trade faster and trade smarter every single week. Hey there, traders. Welcome back to today's How to Trade Stocks and Options podcast. On the phone, we have a special guest, Michelle Schneider. Now, Michelle, she is the Director of Trading Education and Research at MarketGage.com, and she's also the author of Plant Your Money Tree, A Guide to Growing Your Wealth. I, uh, I think that's pretty cool, uh, Michelle. I, I appreciate you coming on the line today. I, I think we've got a lot to talk about. Well, thank you, Christopher, for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here. Oh, no, the, uh, the pleasure is all mine. I, I really enjoy the fact that I am able to reach out to uh, other traders like yourself and, and uh, feature you guys on, on the podcast and, and certainly help the audience in learning from your expertise. So Michelle, give us, a, give us a little bit of background on, on, on who you are and Market Gage and, and how we came to be today. Okay, well, before, before I got involved in trading, uh, I was a special education teacher. And it's important to note because it came in handy when I was writing my book, and we can come back to that. But I realized when I was in my very young 20s that I had never been out of an institution. Literally, I went from grade school to middle school to high school to college to graduate school into the classroom. Mm. And so there was a very auspicious moment in my life where I was living in Manhattan in a studio apartment on the Upper West Side and the knock at my door changed my life. And that was uh, this girl came to the door and turns out she worked for Merrill Lynch on the Commodities Exchange in New York and asked me if I wanted to come down and see where she worked. And when I went down there, my eyes popped out of my head. I knew that this was what I wanted to do with my life, even though I knew nothing about finance at all. Hmm. So it didn't, it wasn't easy to get a job down there. And interestingly, there weren't very many women, but that wasn't the reason. The reason was because I was a teacher. And there is definitely that adage of those who can't teach, hmm which is sort of ridiculous, but nonetheless, it took a while for me to get a job, and I wound up getting a job for Conti Commodities, which was the futures division of Continental Grain, as an analyst for coffee, sugar, cocoa. So you want to talk about baptism by fire. Yeah. There you go. They just threw me on the floor and said, go. And, um, and so I did. And from there, I wound up becoming an independent trader, and I traded pretty much every commodity on the floor, plus some of the ones that were in Chicago. And I did that for 13 years. And yes, I was one of the few women down there for all that time. So people love to talk about that. And yeah, it was a lot of fun. And of course, there was some sexism. But overall, my experience was if you showed up to the party, you took your hits like the guys, you took your profits like the guys, and you basically didn't do anything unusual uh, that, that would raise eyebrows, didn't matter. I could have been a Martian. I was fully accepted. So I had a great experience in the man's world and taught me a lot about men too, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. Oh yeah. I mean, the locker room mentality very much was the scene because you had thousands of guys standing and then hundreds during one pit. So let's say we look at the crude oil pit, there might be 250 guys there every day standing shoulder to shoulder and me, <laughs> 
<laughs> and of course, I was smaller and not as loud as everybody else. But what I observed was the physicality of men. They hug each other and slap each other on the back and they knock each other and they massage each other and they talk about each other's body parts. Oh, I see you gained some weight. So you lost some weight. Oh, you look good in that shirt, whatever. And I realized that when they do that to a woman, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's like you're accepted in the club kind of thing. Mm. So once I realized that, it made my life a lot easier. Um, and, and anyway, that's just a little aside. So from there, I left the floor and I actually went back into education for a while and I became a consultant for inclusion, which means that I was advising school districts on how to rewrite curriculum so that kids with significant disabilities can access that curriculum in the general ed environment. That also on the shelf, but became very handy later on. Went back into trading with Market Gauge in 2008, right at the crash. And that was great, actually, because we were there for 2009 when it turned around, and here I am ever mm -hmm. since. My, I, I have a, a very strong uh, connection to you now because my, my dad was a special education teacher for 20 years. Oh, wow. And my wife uh, teaches fifth grade right now. And most of everyone in my family is involved in education in some way. Oh, that's um, so, fantastic. yeah, so, so that's, uh, that's pretty interesting. So, yeah, I've, I've been around a lot of uh, special education classrooms um, growing up with that and uh, Special Olympics and, and things like that. So that's really interesting. So, so Mish, you, uh, you at some point wrote a book, right? So yes. when, do, when did that happen? Well, I started writing it actually in 2015, and it finally got published and went out the door May uh, 2019. So it took a while to write the book. Yeah. But this is why I mentioned the special education, because I, I've always been a teacher. No matter what I do, I wind up being a teacher. Even on the floor back in those days, I started charting point and figure charts. Back in those days, you did X's and O's on graph paper. Don't like to date myself too much, but <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, and then I became a teacher. So people would come over to me. Some of the top traders would come over to me and say, hey, Mish, Mish what do you see in the charts? So teaching is my blood. I can't help myself. And so I, I've been teaching throughout the trading process, and I have courses, a part of Market Gauge, where we teach, we do webinars, et cetera. And all of us like to teach, by the way. Um, and so I was like, how can I teach something to people about money and investment that hasn't been written before. Oh, yeah? Right. I mean, that, that sounds like a pretty small sliver of things we could talk about there that hasn't been written before. Right. And the truth of the matter is what I decided to write on is not something that was out of our invention. The idea of phases actually started with Charles Dow when he talked mm. about the bullish phase, the accumulation phase, etc. So I knew phases, though, was a good place to start. And then I took my special education background and how do I modify the curriculum of Wall Street investing money in such a way that it would be accessible to a much broader audience. Hmm. So that's how I got started. So I use the phases sort of as a navigation system because we have six phases. And then what I did in the book is I described each one of those phases, how to identify them, what to do about it, whether it be in investments or changing jobs or sending your kids off to college, what major they should have, good time to buy a house, borrow money, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, so that you could always track using this navigation system where things are at. And from that, you glom so much information. So that doesn't exist in a book because there are books that are technical about phases and will tell you how to trade a phase. And then there are books, of course, that tell you how to diversify your assets or save your money or what have you. But nobody's really put the two together in a user-friendly, anecdotal way. Hmm. Well, that sounds really interesting. And so that's called Plant Your Money Tree, A Guide to Growing Your Wealth. Is that yes. available on Amazon? Yes, it is. And it reached a number one new release in all categories. And then it's now a bestseller in a wealth planning category. And we're actually about to do a, a launch of a 99 cent Kindle special at the end of September. Oh, cool. Um, so hopefully that'll raise the ratings a little. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mish, you and I were talking before about, um, you know, where we wanted to go with this episode. And we talked about strategic planning over the next year. And so I kind of want to pick your brains on that. See where where you're thinking things are going to go or, or what we could do as traders and investors 
because uh, there's a lot going on right now. I mean, 2020 oh, yeah. uh, been the worst, I guess you could say. <laughs> and then on top of that, we have an election right in the middle of uh, of the virus and everything else going on. So yeah, <laughs> it's crazy out there. <laughs> Well, it, it, there's a few things, as you said. I mean, in the, and, and it's really hard to make a hard call prediction um, because there are a couple of variables that we don't know. Not so much the election. I, I, I think I'm pretty certain about what's going to happen with the election. Um, obviously, what do I know? I don't have a crystal ball. But it, I do have a prediction of what's going to happen for the election. And it's based on some research I've done, not just actual research, but then... We just traveled around the entire West uh, and talked to a lot of people. So that helped me make my conclusion about that. But the biggest variable that no one's going to be able to control right now is whether or not we get the second wave of the pandemic mm -hmm. with the colder weather. And that's what people are bracing for. So, so here's my prediction. Uh, number one is uh, we're already seeing this happen. The market, of course, ro rose like crazy from the March Nadir to the peak, really, we had right before Labor Day weekend. Uh, and now the market is struggling here, but on holding pattern in hopes of the stimulus package being mm -hmm. passed. Okay. So in terms of economic growth, the new numbers that have come out in September on the unemployment is showing that it's plateauing. And that will actually rise if there is no stimulus package, for sure. Mm -hmm. If there's a second wave of the pandemic, it will go ballistic. So that's really where we're at. But there's a couple of givens that have happened here. Unless we have a major liquidity crisis, what we're starting to see is inflation coming into play. And I think that's going to continue to rise as we finish 2020 and get into at least the first half of 2021, possibly longer. So we can talk more about that and why. I just don't want to keep babbling on without you having the ability to say something. Oh, no, 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 you're good. Um, usually when I have guests on, I just give them a hot mic and I just kind of sit there and shake my head for a little bit until until they're ready. So it's no problem. Um so, so are you in the camp that we we want more inflation, or are you in the camp that uh, that the new mandate by the Fed is too aggressive on inflation? Well, first of all, I think the Fed is completely out of touch with inflation. So let's oh start yeah, without with a doubt. Yeah, I mean they're they're looking at inflation on the basis of oil prices, and yes, if you look at oil prices, it looks deflationary. I'm looking at inflation because I. Again, don't like to say the years here, but you know, I traded actually and began my career at the height of inflation in the late 70s, early 80s. And it wasn't an oil driven inflation market. And so really basically what we have right now is almost a similar situation where this is not going to be an oil based inflation market. Unless, of course, we see a situation explode in the Middle East or some other reason why oil should go up. At this point, with overproduction, overcapacity, and price slashing, we don't see any reason, and low demand. So let's put that on the shelf and right. look at what's happened here with the dollar, the money supply, the interest rates, and the debt. So we have all these other reasons to think that inflation is already here, if not coming. And everybody who's going to the supermarket knows that they're already paying much higher prices for their food. So I think this is going to be, although gold and silver have already rallied, mm -hmm. I think this is going to be a food-driven inflationary environment. So to answer your question, is that good? No, that's not good. Especially if the dollar goes down because our buying power gets decreased. And at what point does the dollar go down to the point where it's a real threat for the world's reserve currency. That's one of the biggest X factors out there, especially since China has already alluded to the fact that they are looking more at an electronic yuan currency as opposed to the US dollar, and they're reducing their exposure to the dollar because they're worried about inflation, rightfully so. Then you have a burgeoning money supply, printing press that keeps going, debt that is now exceeding our own gross domestic product, labor shortage, supply chain disruption, right? I mean, it sounds terrible, right? But when, I, when you say good or bad, I say we're traders, so we should prepare for it. That's really my bottom line, so. Yeah, that makes sense. So yeah. now the reason I ask about, you know, if, if we're in the camp of, of the inflation or not is, you know, because the Fed really has been out of touch, like you've said, for so long with inflation. And now, I mean, you look at anything 
And it, it feels like it's gone up a lot more than the 2% or, or sub 2% inflation on, on pretty much anything. Uh, yet it never seems to reach their target. Uh, and now we've got basically free money being printed constantly. Where are we going now, right? This is the kind of stuff that that I, I mean, this is one of the reasons why I love having guests on the show because like this kind of macroeconomic stuff is not not my forte whatsoever, but I love asking people about it and getting their different opinions and especially for the audience so they can learn more. Um, and so these are all the questions that I have, right? So where where are we going now? We've got we've got basically unlimited money, unlimited free money, right? What what do we do? Like, it, how can we come back from this? Right? It's uh, the the concern I have uh, is is the unlimited money, is the fact that we just gave like multiple trillions of dollars for stimulus packages and maybe even more in the near future. Uh, we've got the the uncertainty of a, a presidential election. I mean, Mish. What what are we to do? <laughs> well, you've have you've heard about uh, modern monetary policy, right? I've have heard about heard? it, but I think yeah, it'd be okay. worth talking about. Okay, so there are some. There's a school of thought that says that burgeoning debt and printing money excessively doesn't matter as long as the country doesn't default. Okay. Yeah, that's that, that's, <laughs> that's it. In a that, that's that, wait, wait, wait. So, 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 okay, hang on. It <laughs> sounds like you're allowed to cheat on a test as long as you don't get caught. That's what it sounds like to me. <laughs> that's a very good analogy and probably not too far off. And that's essentially what's going on. Not that Jerome Powell has come out and said that he's an MMT guy, but that, that's in essence what I think what the United States is hoping for is that they print enough money to get us through this hard time. And then the economy comes back and they'll be able to slowly raise the rates and pay off some of this debt or not pay off the debt and just erase it and just keep going looking for economic growth. That would be obviously a very good scenario if we can get through it. But again, there comes that word if. There's a lot of ifs here. And the biggest if right now, although I don't think it's so much of an if, is what happens with this new stimulus package. To me, they're playing political football with the people who really need the money desperately in that I think they're waiting for that, the election to get a little closer so it's fresher in the minds of people. Ah, I just got a check. I'm going to vote Republican or I'm going to vote Democrat, as opposed to they're not even going to bother to go out to vote because they're going to think the government has failed them. Mm. So that's why I think we're waiting here, or the set, the Congress and the Senate are waiting. Uh, wow, and that, I, I think you're totally right. I think you nailed that right on the head. I, that never crossed my mind, but it's it's a sick game to play now because you've got people who like literally need this so they can feed their families, you know. But but we're gonna hold it up for uh, political gain. Ugh. Is this a shock to you? I mean, really, it's, <laughs> it's just so it's just so overt now. It's it's hard to fathom, but it's a game corporations have been playing for a really long time. So most of the profits that corporations have made have gone back into buying their own shares. And that's not allowed to happen right now, which has been interesting. But, you know, that's kind of the name of the game. Politics, you know, for the people, of the people, by the people. Mm. But anyway, let's not get into that discussion. It's just really basically goes goes back to the idea of this modern monetary theory and also the fact that the stimulus is out there, probably will pass, which will add another two possible. I think if they're between 800 billion is what the Republicans are saying and 3 trillion, which is the max of what Democrats are saying, if you're gonna find some kind of compromise in there, I think they'll come up with something like one and a half trillion dollars. But Michelle, you just told me that these numbers don't matter. They don't count. They're not real numbers anyway. Right. So well, they, they're, they're real. I mean, the money will be real if it can come to people who need it, you know, especially the people who are furloughed, whose, whose money is running out, or these loan moratoriums where the loan expiration to, ha to have to pay back is due. It will make a difference to small businesses, many of which are just hanging on by, the, by their threads. Mm -hmm. um, so I do think it'll have a huge impact in terms of the debt. And the money supply, yeah, it will continue to grow. Whether or not that has an impact, like I said, really is going to make a, a big deal on whether or not the United States defaults or not. And right now, we're hanging tough. That's going to be something else to look at in 2021. And the one thing that scares me more than anything is the U.S. dollar. 
and the threat of it losing its status as the world's reserve currency. That would not be a good situation for the United States. And that's why it's so important that we play nice with our allies. So, so, so on that, I have two questions then. So what would cause it to be devalued enough to where it no longer becomes the world standard? And number two, so, so first, what would cause it? And number two, how can we avoid that? Well, the three countries that we should be looking at as a, the biggest threat for that happening to us would be Russia, India, and China. Hmm. And now, in though India and China are having their own little war going on there, before that was happening, they were actually meeting, the three countries were meeting to talk about this. And petrol dollars, which is something very important, obviously, to Russia and China, well, all the countries that have huge populations and need oil at this point, that petrol dollars are still based in U.S. dollars, right? And that's one of the reasons why um, the Saudis have been very quick to lower the price to make it competitive in U.S. dollars. So essentially, if those three countries came together and said, we are changing how petrodollars are, are spent, and it's not going to be in U.S. currency, but it's going to be in yuan, let's say, I doubt very much whether the ruble would be uh, in, in contention, that would be a real threat, but it would take a global um, organization for it to really impact on, on a very extreme way. So we'll see. China has a lot of cards in its favor because, I mean, here's, it just this, this is what perplexes me is our war with China, and I understand. I mean, we really definitely should be less dependent on China for everything that we are. But yet I just went shopping over Labor Day weekend, and I'm literally everything I picked up everything I picked up is made in China. Yeah. So, I, yeah. So I just don't know how this is all going to resolve. And maybe again, another political football and we'll just go away perhaps in a second term for Trump or perhaps with Biden. I don't know. But this is really how to avoid it, I think would be basically to try to figure out how we're going to reconcile this situation where we're still so China dependent and they're ability to produce goods is way cheaper than ours. Just end of story. Mm -hmm. Ah, all right, Mish. We can't Long leave. answer. Sorry, Christopher. <laughs> no, you're good. We can't leave on a down note like that. No, no, let's be happy. <laughs> so let's, let's circle the trains back around here. Okay. What can we do over the next uh, 12 months or so for our portfolios, for our families, things like that, um, to you know, kind of just uh, be prepared, be on the defensive rather than the, the offensive. I, I certainly, in my household, we've been very defensive, right? We're, we're hoarding stimulus money and, and, and uh, bonuses and, and things like that uh, for in case of a rainy day to come through. And, you know, with, with the virus still out there, now with school's all back in session, at least here in Texas, um, the second wave that you're talking about, I, I could definitely see it happening. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need you to come and rescue me because I just put us back on a downer note. So what, what do you think we can do over the next few months? Well, one thing in terms of the portfolio, I definitely think that if you are uh, heavily into certain types of stocks, particularly value stocks that have gotten killed, you should probably consider getting out of those stocks at this point. It doesn't seem like value is coming back anytime soon. Uh, growth stocks on some kind of a major correction, I would certainly decide whether or not I can sit through a major correction or get out of some of these stocks or take profits in the stocks, wait for some kind of a significant dip. But technology is really probably the most exciting place to be looking at for future growth. Hmm. And not just the Apples and the Amazons and the Googles of the world, but also the newer tech companies that are coming out that are emerging as a result of the stay at home environment, the way mm. we travel, the way we eat, the way we go to movies, the way we do everything is going to change and the technology will change with it. And that will give us a tremendous amount of opportunity to invest in some of these new companies, younger people out there, the software techs, et cetera, who are developing these things, including virtual reality, which will become more mainstream. That's what I would focus on as we're going forward. If we get any kind of correction, I'd be shopping for those type of stocks. Wow. Okay. That's really cool. I, I had a guest on not all that long ago, and he was saying that, you know, the flight to safety has changed. Uh, it's no longer the stocks or the, or not stocks, but no longer the gold or the bonds or precious metals and things like that. It's, it's technology stocks, right? 
and you can look at the charts, right? You can see the Qs, uh, I'm sorry, you can see the NASDAQ, how it went up 75% from the March lows to, to the recent Labor Day highs. And I totally, totally, totally agree with him on that sentiment that, you know, the, the historical nature of, you know, the, the safe plays, I think it honestly is changing, which I know sounds crazy to think about, uh, about, you know, Netflix or Amazon or something like that being, or the, Zoom, uh, or, Zoom <laughs> right. or Peloton or right. things like that, that, you know, at one point never, ever would have been considered the, the safety play. Now, somehow the market has shifted to be that. So I totally, totally agree with you there. That's really interesting. Well, I would tweak that just though a little bit to, to what your uh, other person said. Technology is not necessarily a safe play because if the whole market crashes, that's going to crash too. I mean, we're of talking course. about a liquidity thing. But I also believe that I agree with him on bonds. Bonds, which were the classic safety play, may not be so safe. And that's right. obviously because of the yield curve flattening, what the Fed has done, the central banks, et cetera. Wait, it, wait, it, we still have a yield curve? Yeah, we do. It's, <laughs> stupid. That's a finance joke right there, folks. Yeah, right. <laughs> but, but, and gold, you know, is a commodity and it's a physical commodity. So the only thing I would add texture to all that stuff is, yes, I would definitely be looking to shop for technology and especially growth technology. Small cap growth stocks are hot. They've yeah. come off a little bit, but that's we're just creating a model, by the way, to talk about market gauge. We have five quant models and we have a sixth one coming out at the end of September, which is a small cap growth stocks. And those are really tech related in the in the smaller uh, they have a strong balance sheet, but they don't have the capitalization anywhere near something like Apple. And I like that because they're not bloated. So yeah, I would go there, but I would not discount gold. And I would definitely keep my eye on the dollar. If I had one major tip to give people, it would be that watch the US dollar. And how do they watch that? Well, you can definitely look uh, online and see what the dollar is doing versus, let's say, the euro. Mm -hmm. um, right now, the euro is trading over the dollar. For a while, the dollar was kind of on par with the euro. Uh, I would look at the dollar versus the yen also, and I would look at the yuan and watch the yuan and what's that doing in China. But really, you can just basically listen and very easily Google uh, what's the dollar worth today and watch to see, look at a chart. And anybody, even people who don't know how to read a chart, could see if something is heading this way or going <laughs> this way. <laughs> You'd be surprised. I uh, I was real dense when I first started trading, so it took me a while to figure out what a trend was. So, <laughs> well, that's oh, my book. You should read my book. <laughs> uh, I tell you what, that's a great segue. So, so people can get your book on Amazon. Do you have any like? Is there a? Do you have a website for the book? Like, is yes, there a plantyourmoneytree.com? Uh, well, actually, if you just go to marketgauge.com, okay. uh, as soon as you click on our website, the first thing you see, the big banner on top, is uh, a picture of me standing next to my book. And if you buy it there, you get a bonus, a free bonus of a video where I describe those phases in detail and oh, go cool. through the charts. So that would probably be a good way to do it. But Amazon, yeah. Walmart, Target, I mean, you can get it anywhere. So if you're standing next to the book, this must be a pretty giant book. <laughs> oh, the wonders of technology. Yeah, right. <laughs> I've written a short guide on how you can use the triple stock profit system. It's the secret weapon every investor needs right now to change your financial future. And you can get it for free by visiting triplestockprofits.com or in the links below. Also, if you want to join a community of traders just like you, you can get free access to the elite membership that has even more resources to help you trade faster and trade smarter. <laughs> Well, uh, Mitch, this has been a, a, a great pleasure. Um, I, I appreciate being able to, to meet uh, to meet you today and to learn more about you, Market Gauge, your book. Um, and I would absolutely recommend for the audience to just straight right now, go to marketgauge.com, check out Michelle's book, uh, grab that today, and then you know learn more about Market Gauge while you're there and, and Michelle. So Michelle, this has been really great. I've learned a lot. And uh, you know, let's definitely keep an eye on the dollar and see what happens there. Great, Christopher. Thank you so much. I look forward to seeing what happens over the next six months and we can check back with each other. You know what? <laughs> That's a great idea. Let's put it on the calendar six months from now, seeing, seeing how things turned out. All with, right. Without a doubt, we'll be out of 2020. So, so fingers crossed, 2021 will be better. <laughs> exactly. <laughs>
And, and by but, the way, the Chinese calendar starts again in terms of the year of. So the, we're in the year of the rat right now, which is the 12th animal. So we okay. go back to the beginning. So maybe that'll be a fresh start as well. Oh, let's hope so. 2020 <laughs> can't end soon enough. <laughs> okay. Well, Mish, thank you so much for your time. And, and thank you guys for tuning into today's How to Trade Stocks and Options podcast. Make sure you like, subscribe, and enable notifications. That way you never miss any of the tools, tips, and tricks to help you trade faster and trade smarter. And I'll see you on the next episode. Hey, if you like this video, let me know by leaving me a like below and then subscribe and share it with somebody you think could use it as well. Be sure to comment below with your biggest takeaway from this episode and any suggestions you have for future episodes. And finally, make sure you watch these other videos to help you trade faster and trade smarter. And I'll see you on the next episode.